Okay. So other questions. I would love to work there. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'd love for more people to work here too, but that's revenue. Um, so yeah, um, I'll get myself out of the Instagram camera because uh, I really can't deal with that right now. But just to let everyone know, the other thing I want to get done today um, is I'm going to be doing some YouTube videos for the channel. And um, those videos are actually going to cover all of our new products. They're going to cover um, basically the process for using them to grow your own mushrooms. Um, we've got a lot of really exciting things that have been happening because more and more, like I was saying earlier, uh, we're getting involved in legalization and other things. And so we've been rolling out more and more genetics from our library. So we've got probably 120 different culinary and medicinal species, followed by another um, 30 or 40 therapeutic species. So all told, I'm looking, I'm staring down the barrel of having to maintain a 200 plus species culture library, which is vaguely intimidating. So, give me one second. I'm gonna kill that stream and I'm going to swap over to regular old Instagram on that. I'm gonna kill that. I'm gonna kill that. I'm gonna kill that. Wait, where'd my picture go? There we go. Cool. Well, anyways, YouTube and everyone else, you get you get me in all of my beautiful glory. Now, where is my other camera stand? Because I'm just going to turn around and do this old-fashioned way. Working in the hood. So if you're on the stream and you want to uh, ask questions or anything else like that, feel free. Um, but again, as always, everything that I'm showing you and everything that I'm doing is actually available on our website. Therapeutic agricultures, therapeutic LC cultures, gourmet cultures, you name it, we've got it. All right. Well, now that I've uh, done Instagram and I've redone it, let's actually get started. So for those of you on the stream and watching, I'm going to be sealing these auger plates. Now, um, I actually got a really good question yesterday when I was doing this. Um, and the question is, is, like, how do you prevent contamination from the uh, heat gun? from hitting your auger dishes? And the answer is actually really simple. Did you notice that the first thing I did is I picked this up and I put it in my sterile airflow? Then I'm sterilizing it. That's how you prevent contamination from blowing from this into my auger plates. That's it. All you've gotta do is remember, if you're trying to keep sterile, uh, sterile workspace, Everything that goes into the sterile zone has to be sterilized. Everything coming out of the zone has to be like it's not sterile anymore, right? So the heat gun, all you have to do is put it into sterile airflow. And then that hot little bugger uh, just starts blowing hot air and you're off to the races. Now, this particular heat gun actually has an attachment on it. So by the way, Instagram... I'm also on YouTube, Twitch, and everything else. So if you've got any questions, anything else, feel free to ask, but I've got a lot of stuff to do. I need to make some auger grains. I need to do liquid culture extractions. First, I gotta seal all these, because I was a dummy and went, went and poured more. And of course, my phone came off the thingy, which made it fall down, so I have to put it back up. Because Instagram, come to find out, for all of you on Instagram Live, 
Instagram blocks you from using microphones. They want you to use your bare old phone. So unfortunately, when I take you and I put you in the flow hood, Instagram makes it so that I actually can't talk to you. All right, so everyone on the stream, everyone on Instagram, feel free to ask any questions. Like I was saying earlier, um, we I've been doing product updates this week because production is fully up and running here at Humble Fungus after the move. Um, and so with production up and running, I also added a bunch of therapeutic liquid cultures to the website today. Extended the therapeutic agriculture section and the culinary and medicinal sections as well. So like I said, we are operating at full steam. Later today, I'll be recording and uploading product overviews for YouTube. And um, yeah, basically my modus operandi now is to start streaming more and more and teaching you more and more now that we got that move out of the way. And then when I get the rest of my goddamn medication, I can finish the goddamn book. Anyway, got a bunch of isolations to do today, too. Um, although, that will probably be weekend work for me, sadly. Oh, I couldn't tell what was melting on this. Check that out. Oh, that's awful. Somebody had the heat gun sitting up here. And so it like melted all the plastic on the end. Cool. Yo, what's up, Foghorn? I'm streaming on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. Just hanging out here in the flow hood working. I got to seal these plates. Then I've got to do uh, a bunch of green inoculations and other stuff. So follow along for the ride. Ask any questions, ask how to grow. It's all free game. All free game. First, we seal. Now, I poured these plates maybe an hour ago. So, they're still pretty warm. Um, lots of condensation on these because they're still fresh. What's the benefit of inoculating with LC versus auger? That's a great question. Okay, so auger. I love using auger for everything, right? Um, and the reason why I love using auger is because if I look at an auger culture, I can generally tell just by looking at it whether or not it's contaminated. However, Using an auger plate to a three pound bag of grain isn't optimal because it's not a lot of biomass, right? So basically you've got maybe 16 uh, milliliters of auger in here versus say a liquid culture, which would be uh, 10 ml of pure living biomass. So um, we actually use both here. Um, if we're starting off a new species, very frequently we won't have liquid culture for it. And so what we'll do is we'll actually start with a couple of auger plates put to millet. We'll grow that out and that will be our grain master. And then we'll expand that grain master via grain to grain to 10 more bags, right? So that's how we treat auger to grain. Um, I would have thrown my bins away if it weren't for this channel. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, trust me, just remember, if you're new to this and you're struggling, we all struggle. This is stuff can be hard. Oh, okay, why is it my sterilized grain inoculated with a spore syringe showing any signs of my ceiling growth? It's been five days. So, Faro, um, let me answer. Uh, so I'm going to finish the liquid culture question after I finish this. The problem that you have is you just injected spores into sterile grain. Now, for all of you on the stream, what are spores, right? Just ask yourself, what's a spore? Well, a spore 
is inert. It is dead. It is a spore is not alive. It is a series of chemicals, acids, and proteins all bundled up into an inert little ball, right? And spores are not mycelium. And so the problem that you have is when you inject a bunch of spores into, into grains, they don't understand what they're doing, right? So they have to germinate, they have to worry about any contaminants, etc. Um, it's like, it's when you're dealing with spores, they've got to germinate, right? And so that germination process can take a week. It can take two weeks. It can take a month in some species cases. Um, and so the reason why you're not seeing any growth tomorrow is because you injected it with spores. Those spores are slow, right? This is why I never inject spores to grain, right? Whenever I get spores, I always put them on an auger dish, right? Because in that way, I can select breeding pairs, right? Because if you take two spores, they mate, you get one fungus, but that one fungus could have 16 different genetic lines contained within that fungus, right? But because you're using multiple spores and those spores are inert, when you inject that into the grain, right, now it's a race, right? When you're growing mushrooms, you have to think of it as a race. You are trying to grow the fungus that you want faster than all other fungi and bacteria in that space. Now you're probably saying, hey, wait a minute. If grain is sterile and my spore syringe is sterile, then why would I have to worry about bacteria and contamination? It's because it's not sterile. It's, you've exposed it to open air. You've injected a bunch of water to it. You've injected a bunch of inert material that could or could not be contaminated. Um, you know, the list goes on. Filter patches allow gas transfer. And so what ends up happening is when you take, uh, like, say, you inject 10 cc's of spore solution into a grain bag, you're going to have what's called the stall, right? The stall is where you're waiting for those uh, spores to germinate and then take off and start micellating, right? The reason why I never apply spores directly to grain is because I don't want any bacteria, contamination, or anything else to outrace the fungus I want to grow, right? So it, let's say that um, I have a multi-spore syringe and I inject it. There's a very greater than non-zero chance that that's going to just contaminate. And the reason why is you just injected new moisture into a static environment, e.g. the grain bag, throwing everything out of whack. Now you have to wait two to three weeks for those spores to germinate in that bag. Faster if you're lucky. Right? So believe it or not, this actually brings us full circle to the original question. Um, liquid culture versus auger versus spores, right? So you, if you don't apply a spore syringe to grain, what do you do with it? Well, you get yourself an auger dish and you squirt one to two ml onto that auger dish of that spore solution and you wait for it to micellate and you'll start seeing little circular growth patterns. It's going to look super cute. Like, it, it, you're just like, oh, look, mommy and daddy had a little baby fungus. And the fungus is like, hey, I'm a baby fungus. Um, and so with spores, you really have to think of those as eggs, right? They've got to be incubated. They have to be taken care of. They're not, they're not strong enough to fight off trichoderma, blue-green mold, um, even the smallest of bacterial infections could throw off uh, a mated pair of spores if it's early enough in their development cycle. So usually the process is you take spores, like a spore print, a spore swab, um, or a spore syringe, and you apply that to auger. That allows um, the fungus to actually germinate, and then um, you can take that and apply that to grain, or make a liquid culture from that. Yeah. 
I've got it. I'm ready to pull it. Yeah. No, I let me pull it. I'll just put the ready sheet right now. Yeah. Give me a second. I need to swap tasks. We got to get an order out the door, which means I have to pull liquid culture. So, as I was saying, spores are inert, right? Spores are immune to radiation for the most part. They're immune to cosmic rays. They're immune to um, random acts of violence. They're immune to um, all sorts of things, right? And so this is why there's a group of us who probably think that the first organic life really was kicked off by fungi from space. Um, so that's all cool though. But the moral of the story is that spores are inert, right? So you can't count on them to give you a viable biological load. Not for the show. That's the inevitable. I'll pull another one. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so spores. Don't inject spores to grains, substrates, and things like that. Your best bet, um, your best bet is to sit down, put it to auger, let them breed, let them mate, let them isolate. What's up, Michael Jordan? Um, so now I'm going to go back to the liquid culture versus agriculture thing, uh, which is actually fairly advantageous given I have to pull a couple of syringes. Um, but first, I have to go get a jar. Talk a chestnut. No, no, no. I need something interesting. I need something with mm, and uh, circumstance. Ooh, shiitake. Oh, heck yeah. Somebody's getting this beautiful shiitake culture. Look at that. Mm. Mm. So, Faro, um, I do have a book coming out. So everyone on the stream, I am working on a book. It's called Applied Mycology. Um, but Faro, don't worry about taking the slow way, right? Um, you just have to remember that, you know, we're all still learning. And you have to just learn to accept failure. Trust me, it's like I've thrown away hundreds of thousands of contaminated plates. I've thrown away eight, <laughs> hundreds of pounds of bad brains. Um, Oh, if you're interested in any of this, right? Where can you buy the book? Humblefungus.com. That's our shop. We've got grains, cultures, substrates, all of it. Um, but as I was saying, just remember we're all learning. And mycology is a very, very young discipline, which means that in terms of science, it's an infant. It's actually smaller than an infant. It's like a mini infant. Right. Um, and so mycology is really new. And so you just can't take things as like the truth. Right. Because remember, science is not about truth. Science is about like provable data to support a theory. Should that data be wrong or that theory be wrong, that theory is no longer true. So let me blow your mind real fast. We're now in a decade where there are two things which cannot be simultaneously true. Einstein's theory of relativity and subatomic and the subatomic realm, like quantum physics. Um, and so those two things are irreconcilable. In other words, quantum physics handles small objects, right? Einstein's theory of relativity is all large objects. In the next decade, one of those two things will be proven false. They cannot both be true. So think about this. In a decade, it's very possible Einstein's theory of relativity will be proven wrong. That's science, baby. Mycology, same deal. 
It ain't true unless you can prove it. And even then, there's probably more than one way to do it. So, what does chestnut mushroom taste like? Uh, it, so, it doesn't taste like white buttons or cremonies. Uh, a chestnut mushroom has a good, nutty, smoky flavor. Um, it's Piopino actually have a good pistachio flavor. It's really great. But, <laughs> that's a good point. If you go to the store, this is a question from YouTube about different types of mushrooms and flavor. If you go to the grocery store, you buy white button, portobello, crimini, etc. They're all the same mushroom. They're all agaricus bisporus, just picked at a different point in the life cycle or with a different mutation. In other words, a different bacterial pair. So, any clarity on the liquid culture process? I'm a beekeeper. So, okay. Any clarity on the liquid culture process? I, oh, wait, okay, I'm a beekeeper and read that bees are eating mycelium in the wild. Yes, so if you get one of our mushroom grow kits off the website, I'm gonna tell you how to save the bees in a real quick uh, thing. Okay, if you wanna help save the bees or help with hive collapse, um, take spent mushroom blocks or cakes and find a hive and actually place those blocks nearby the hive, like on, like at the base of the tree and things like that. Because bees do are attracted to the mycelium, and that mycelium will very frequently help the bees fight off invaders and things like that. So you can actually rein, uh, reinforce a colony using fungi. Boom! You can help the bees in your backyard just by getting a fruiting kit. <clears throat> Um, so liquid culture, running a magnetic stir the whole time. Uh, so Alaku, uh, I'm hoping I pronounced that correctly. Um, basically don't overthink liquid cultures. This liquid culture is 25 is, yeah, it's, uh, 25 grams of honey to 900 ml water. Like, I don't stir these constantly. You can see it's got like this big old baby in there. Like some of these are fruiting. Like if I, oh, hold on. Let me blow all of your minds. This is why I say the way that you do things don't matter. Um, so soy peptones and other things are great, but I like honey. Honey is naturally antibacterial and aseptic. It's very clean. And see that? Can anyone tell me what those are? Right? All that little white peaking on that? Wait, hold on. I'll just answer the question. That is the agaricon mushroom. If you're a fan of pulse stamets, you know that this is the god mushroom. You know that this is also an endangered species. And what this is, what that is, that's not infection. That's not contamination. That's pin set. I have the agaricon mushroom pinning on my liquid culture. See? I could actually fish one of these out Clone it. So that's why liquid culture, like your liquid culture recipe, it's kind of like neither here nor there. You no, know, it's whatever works. But I really like honey because it's sterile by nature. And it actually has something that's super critical to fungal development, bacterial avenues. In other words, it's got the right chemicals and it's got the right acids and sugars to help the fungi attract and create and just basically generate the bacteria that they're paired with. So that means I can get things like morels and agaricon to fruit in vitro. 
And also, yeah, the shelf life on Honey is bloody amazing. Like, I've some of these LCs, like, this one is from December 19th, 2020. M Manuka Honey? Manuka Honey? Manuka I don't know what that is. Yeah, um, Matt, um, that's a really good question. Yeah, we don't use Manuka honey because it's unfiltered. Ray was just filling me in on it. But you could totally try it. I actually, like, the reason why I use honey is because I kind of stumbled on this happy accident. Right? Okay, so I still have to go back to the LC versus auger question, but can you do all of that with 40 bucks worth of equipment? Yes, I can. In fact, at home, I don't have a flow hood. At home, I've got my still air box. Yeah. Still air boxes are bloody amazing, like especially if I'm working with contaminated samples before I got this vertical flow hood. Like, hell yeah. Like, that's my jam. Like, the still air box, like, works great. So, you get yourself a $7 Sterilite tub, cut some holes in it. Now you've spent $7 and created a flow hood. Well, flow hood. But you can pour auger in it. You can pull LCs, make LCs. Thanks, Hongo. This is, this setup is a lot of work and a lot of love. Um, but, um, the good news, or the crazy, uh, the best news, is that we bought all of these used. This flow hood is 2014-2021. This is from the University of Texas Health Science Center. Um, Uni University of Texas lab. This is used. This has been used. All of our hoods. Um, these hoods. Here, why don't you take these? Sorry, guys. Uh, we're filling orders while I'm doing this. So, so yeah. Um, that one's okay. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, I use the still air box. Now, I have to keep a train of thought because I still have a question. I have to go back to LC versus auger for inoculation. Um, are jars getting easier to find? Holy shit, yuck. I am sorry for cussing, but you still can't find port jars in stock after two years? Okay, so I'm lucky. Here in Colorado, we have Kroger's or King Supers, and they usually have them in stock. Ace Hardware usually has them in stock now. And um, who else? Tractor Supply sometimes has them, and Jax sometimes has them. Sup, Twisted Tree? Yeah, dude, it's 5,000 square feet, and, like, I was just telling everyone that we bought all of our flow hoods used, so it's like, this, this flow hood cost me a whopping 1,500 US dollars. Like, this, you can go to your local university, you can go to your local labs, you can go to, like, reclaimers and things like that, and you can go and buy things like this, and this flow hood, like, it'll last... Decades. Decades. Yeah. Yeah. But, hey, if you're interested in liquid culture jars and you want us to bring our pre-made liquid culture kit back to the website, so it's basically, it's a um, pint mason jar with magnetic screw bar and a lid like this with injection port and filter. Um and we seal it up and we put the powders in and everything. You just add water and sterilize. If you're interested in that, drop me an email at team at humblefungus.com and we'll add those back to the site. We took them off because they weren't big sellers, but I guess if I have an easy supply of mason jars, why not spread the love? Also, I have more magnetic stir bars than I can shake it. For some reason, I thought I needed 400 stir bars a year ago. <laughs> Apparently, no one needs 400 freaking stir bars. Yeah, yeah, I need like seven. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I could open up a restaurant, but believe it or not, we're going to be working on commercial kitchen certification one day. Um, we've got this clean room like next week. And then we have to make a lot of soil. So we make everything in house. So all of our substrates are made in house. I measure everything that goes into every batch of substrate. It's precisely four pounds compost of manure substrate. Um, five scoops, and I'm gonna tell you how big the scoops are of gypsum. One scoop uh, hydrated lime. You know, I can tell you the recipe for every one of our substrates off the top of my head, and every single batch is made exactly the same. And so we do that here in house, which is why we need a warehouse. Um, in addition to prepping, prepping millet, doing everything else. Um, best budget flow hood. Um, I'm not being sarcastic when I say it's still air box. I, I was telling everybody earlier on the stream that I still use my still air box at home. Um, as for budget ones, uh, I would go and look online. So all of my flow hoods, I when I was still building flow hoods, uh, I built my flow hoods. Then I realized that that was a fool's game and uh, I wasn't making any money on it and I was blowing too much labor. And also, I'm not very good at it. Right? It's like, no. Then I realized that mycology happened to forget that biology existed and like all the other sciences existed. And I went down to a secondhand equipment store and I bought my first flow hood. Right? It's just a clean room fan filter unit and I bought it for $400. My second flow hood I bought off of eBay. You can go to eBay, type in clean room fan filter unit, FFU, and you'll see a whole bunch of them, and you can get them dirt cheap. I got all of these from Reclaimed Labs. All you got to do is clean them up and take care of them, and they'll last for decades. So, I need to pull these filters. So I'm going to turn around away from the camera. But uh, while I'm doing that, uh, I'll actually describe. I'll actually go into the auger, uh, auger to grain versus liquid culture. So the big thing with uh, auger is that you don't have a lot of mass. Sorry. You don't have a lot of biomass because, well, honestly, there's not a lot in that auger, right? Meanwhile, this liquid culture is a solid quart of living mycelium. Like, this looks clear. It ain't clear. There's mic in there, right? And once I blend that up, what that did is that took, like, imagine if you took your auger, added a cup of water, threw it in a blender, and just blended that up, right? Now you've quadrupled, even 10x, the amount of biomass you have. Um, yeah, no, filters are uh, fil uh, good. Heap of filters are like 600 bucks a pop. It's ridiculous. Anyways, um, so liquid culture versus auger is really a, uh, a bit of personal preference. Like I said, we do auger to grain for uh, masters, right? So we'll make um, a three pound grain bag with um, one auger dish. Then we'll do a grain to grain expansion of that dish using... Um, 10 more bags. So that one master bag goes to 10 more grain bags. And then Bob's your uncle. There's my syringe tips. So why would you use liquid culture? Easy. There's going to be virtually no lag time. And the reason why is because instead of having to deal with a lower amount of biomass to grow off of, you inject 10 cc's or more of liquid culture, which is pure living biomass. This liquid culture is pretty much going to start micellating within the first 72 hours. And so your auger plate will also micellate really fast, but because there's less biomass, it will colonize more slowly. So liquid culture is all about speed. Just to remind everyone, everything is available up on the website, including um, our culinary, medicinal, and therapeutic cultures. We rolled more of those out today. 
under the uh, genetics category on the website, humblefungus.com. Uh, we rolled out even more therapeutic liquid and agricultures. We, I added a bunch of um, culinary ones, took some off because I don't want to sell them anymore. Okay, I pulled a couple of reishi. I'm going to keep pulling these. So yeah, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of this. So I've got to pull more of these. I actually don't need that syringe anymore. Where's my sharps container? By the way, go to Amazon. God, yeah, no, uh, Foghorn, as soon as I get a little bit of free money, um, I went through and um, I designed a lure lock system um, with backflow control that I want to try out um, because what I'll end up doing is just running the lure lock line into the bottom of the jar from here and I can just lure lock extract here versus needles. How many sterilized plastic liquid culture lids before you toss them? Dude, Max. Max, uh, Max on YouTube just asked, like, how many sterilization runs we get with these plastic lids. I ha <laughs> Max, I haven't thrown a single one of these away yet. And that's two years. Some of these lids are over two years old. Rishi, I don't have the official labels for them yet because I have to print them off my phone. So yeah, no, it's um, a lot of the equipment that we use, like I actually have, I get fewer uses out of metal lids than I do the plastic BPA lids because the plastic BPA free lids are actually like, they ain't gonna rust. Yeah, no, it, it, it's straight up, it's rust. Uh, how about replacing the filters on the LC lids? We actually replace the filters after, like, so if this filter were to be dark or something, I'd actually take it right here sterilize this, wipe it down, and then put a new filter patch on it immediately. And the second I saw any type of discoloration. Otherwise, we only replace these um, when we change it out. So when we wash it out, the second that filter patch gets wet, we toss it. Um, oh yeah, and the other time you throw away filter patches or you have to throw away spawn and fruiting blocks is usually when your mycelium and your fungus decides to crawl through the damn thing and fruit. I pulled a bag of lion's mane spawn out of the tent earlier and it was pushing against the filter patch, trying to root through it. And I was like, no, stop it. I was like, no, stop it now. Yeah, as long as it's an oyster. Oh yeah, just yeah, just cut max. Yeah. Yeah. Just Yeah, no, you can just cut it on the side, just cut a little X. Bob's your uncle. Yeah. Lion's mane, by the way, if you want a fruit and easy mushroom, get a lion's mane fruiting kit because you take it home, you escape the air, and you cut two little X's like marshmallow. The DJ guy. Syringe filters, I don't really use them. I found them to be fussy and kind of a pain in the ass. Um, we use Microfose filters. Um, you can catch them on Instagram. We also sell them on the website. But these little filter patches we use everywhere. We use it on our grain bags. Uh, these are adhesive, right? So we don't we sterilize with these on the jars. But for example, our grain bags are sterilized, then we adhere these. Um, these filter patches, also adhesive, right? Um, because in that way, I don't have to pay crazy markups for things with pre-built filter patches in them. Also, Micropose makes some good shit. Some of his, some of his filter patches are so sticky that it's, uh, it'll pull the glove off your hand. All right. You, you just need one gourmet?
Okay, so you needed one more species. Yeah, one more species. Two of them. Two syringes? Yeah. Can you make like five? Yeah, I'll make five. So that one, uh, go ahead and cut the top off. Let it fruit out of the top. Yeah, or just cut a slit across the front, like a hood. Yeah. And that'll, it'll. And this, and this is the one that will overhang and then it will grow. Like yep. Like yep. Yep. Yeah, a Amazon knockoff uh, microphones filters are not good. Why can't you hear the flow hood? Uh, I've got noise cancellation on, and also I've got my mic on, so it's picking me up. Um, also, this flow hood is a vertical flow hood, and I just pulled that needle out even though I didn't want to. Damn it. Uh, this is a vertical flow hood, and it's actually pretty quiet, um, but I've actually got noise canceling on right now. Um, but this flow hood that I'm working on cost me $1,500 American. I bought it used. It's probably 10 plus years old. It's been used by students and everything else. And guess what? I fired it up and I had it up running and sterile within an hour. That's what real no bullshit lab equipment can do for you. Like this stuff will last for uh, decades. My one flow hood, uh, Rossinante, uh, it's from 1977. It's older than I am. Yeah, no, Matt, um, basically in mycology, if you pay bottom dollar for mushroom grow bags, you get what you pay for. If you pay bottom dollar for discount Amazon filter patches, you get what you pay for. Right. So that's why I use a lot of unicorn bags, right? Because I don't steer clear. I, I don't walk around with my vendors once I know that they work. But if you want to go, like I said, if you want to go and get cheap flow hoods, <clears throat> if you want to go and get cheap flow hoods, like I said, go to eBay, search for clean room fan filter unit, FFU. Those little bad boys have been running biology laboratories since, I don't know, 18th, 19th century? Yeah. Early 19th century, we pretty much figured that shit out. Actually, no, it was after the Spanish flu, which means it was after World War I. No, that was still 19th. I don't like that whole big old air bottle bubble in the top. Oh, look at that. It's thick. Yeah, it's when I first started off, I bought everything, like cheap knockoffs on Amazon of everything. And I couldn't figure out why everything kept like sucking wind because I'm sitting there looking at other commercial mushroom farms and they're like, we have a contamination rate of 20%. That's really low. And I'm like, I'm an engineer. 20% variance on anything is shit. I mean, screw that. Um, but you know, I start off and I'm buying all this cheap stuff off of Amazon and I had like a 60, 70 percent contamination rate. And I'm like, well, maybe 20 percent is really good. Um, then I unscrewed my shit and I found good vendors. I use unicorn bags. I use microphones. I use, you know, I use vendors I know I trust and I use equipment that I know will last. And I know that have been tested. Because, yeah, it's so <clears throat> something as simple as the size of the hole or the adhesive you use on your filter patches and injection ports, that's all the difference, right? Because if this adhesive fails on this injection port, contamination. If the adhesive fails on those patches, contamination. If you buy a knockoff mushroom bag on Amazon, and it's got a filter micron size of 0.7 or larger, contamination, right? What size drill? Um, pretty sure quarter inch drill bit. 
Yeah, it's um, I've looked at the bottle method of farming, and the big problem with the bottle method is you're trading off waste in your washing and maintenance process for single-use plastics, right? You're basically trading things off. Now, I'm not going to advocate for single-use plastics. Trust me. There's a reason I've got Pluteris ostriatus sitting here chewing on some. Um, yeah, pearl oysters love eating plastics. And wood and everything else, frankly. It's like, it's like, ew, no one else likes that pizza. Give it to pearl oyster. He'll eat anything. But, um, so the problem with the Japanese method is that they're trading off, um, because you've got to sterilize everything, right? And so that automated bottle farming, you spend a lot more on the back end sterilizing, reprepping, and cleaning everything um, versus what we do, which is we'll take the single-use plastic and we'll bioremediate it, right? Because they're oxygenatable, they're um, they decay real fast out in the sun, and uh, they decay real fast in my compost heap. Especially when I take a bunch of used pearl oyster mushroom blocks and I throw it into the compost heap along with the unicorn beds. So, <clears throat> filter patches, real quick. Filter patches come in a bunch of sizes. They can go from 0.2 micron to 0.7 micron. The bigger the rating, the bigger the hole. The bigger the hole, the more contaminants that can fit through it. So, here's an example. Trichoderma's molecule size cannot pass through a 0.2 micron filter patch. However, black mold can go sub one millimeter, right? In other words, it can have such a small particle size that it can actually pass through a 0.2 micron filter patch. Is pearl oyster the fastest colonizing uh, oyster that I know of? Yes, actually. Like it's, um, no, no, it, but they, they wanted oysters, not turkey tail. Right. So in terms of colonizers, like pearl oyster, like we've got this Pearl street oyster. It's a clone of an oyster we got on Pearl street down in Boulder and, um, shiitake. Really? Oh yeah, now I'm cleaning up. Or I'm trying to pull gourmet pin packs, and it's like I have so many species, I just reach in there randomly, and somehow I grabbed another shiitake in the list. Yep, black mold. So black mold, black mold is a bitch. This is why I'm going to give you pro tip number 432. Go and get yourself a HEPA air filter for a house, right? Go to Amazon, spend about a... 100 to 150 bucks, go and get a home 99% pure HEPA filter for your house. Go to Amazon, get one. Put that in your brooding chamber, uh, put that in your myco space. In other words, your incubator, your clean room space, uh, and things like that. You really want to put a HEPA filter in there. And the reason why is because shit like black mold will pass through those filter patches no matter what you do. Right, because it can have a really, really, really small particle size. So we actually have HEPA filters in everything. I've got these little $50 HEPA filters I put in the spawn chamber, the fruiting block chamber, and the fruiting chamber. Then, of course, we've got our HEPA filters here. Right, so air is your enemy. All right, that is now done. Now I can go back to sealing this, these plates. Ridiculous. But yeah, <clears throat> once again, ow, shoot, I just poked myself with a needle because I'm a dummy. Ow. That's why we have sharps containers. All right, I'm gonna take a break from the stream. I'm gonna, well, actually I'm gonna answer one more question, then I'm gonna take a potty break. I'll be back on the stream very, very quickly because I got a lot of work to do.
Um, question, I have a Mirtha style growth in. Can I do both inoculated grain spawn and also substrate that's been inoculated in there? Okay, Faro, uh, your spawn, you want to incubate in a dark, warm place. Your fruiting blocks should go in the Martha, right? You don't want your grain spawn to be exposed to humidity or anything else like that. You want that in a dark, warm place, like the soil. Um, and then, yeah, put everything else in the fruiting chamber. And what would you say are the top things to increase yield in a mono tub? Ooh. Um, airflow. Airflow. So if you want to increase your yields on anything, increase the amount of spawn that you're using, get closer to a one to two or a one to one spawn ratio to sub. Number two, airflow. Don't use unmodified tubs. Unmodified tubs will adversely affect your pin set and everything else like that. Why? Because there's no oxygen. There's no airflow. It's got very minimal oxygen and a whole bunch of CO2 and a bunch of standing moisture. Your unmodified tubs are now trichoderma farm. So what you want to do is you want to punch air holes in your tub, put filter patches over those. That will help distribute fresh air. Right, and that will help increase your yields. It'll make your mushrooms much, much happier. The other thing you wanna do is control your misting. Remember, your fungus isn't drinking the stuff that you missed in there, right? And when you miss the tub, you're just keeping the fruits moist, right? That's all you're trying to do. You're trying to make them look sexy, like, hey, baby, you're glistening. Mm. Look at that mushroom, right? So what you actually wanna do is you want to rely off the moisture in the substrate. That's why dunking your cakes you get a massive second flush, right? Because all of a sudden you've rehydrated the cake. Misting won't do that unless you mist real heavily. And again, that will cause contamination. So what you really want to do is to maximize your pin set. You want to have um, early pin set. Or basically, you want to put your tub in the dark, let it colonize. And during that colonization, what you want to do is actually you can cover up those filter ports and let the CO2 increase. Right, You don't want to completely block those filter ports because you need some oxygen, but the more you restrict it, the higher the CO2. Pin sets, fungi like lots of CO2 to increase their pin set coverage. Right. The other thing you do to increase your yields in a mono tub is maintain even humidity. Don't miss the sides of your tub, miss the roof, miss the lid. Right. Because if you're missing the sides, you're getting the sides of the cake wet, you're not getting the center. So you're gonna have a big old dry spot right there in the dead center, right? So yeah, it's uh, I love on monotubs. I love using the microprose filters, right? And yes, I am writing a book, Freddie. It's available up on the website, humblefungus.com. Um, yeah, it's uh, as soon as as soon as I get my brain back on track. Now that we've moved, uh, I'm gonna be ripping through a lot of the book chapters here real soon. Um, but everything is available up on the website. Uh, we also carry the micropose filters and patches. We carry auger cultures, liquid cultures, medicinal, culinary, therapeutic auger and liquid cultures, research cultures. You've got it. You name it. A book. Usually have classes, but we're going to be spinning those back up now that we have enough space to actually have a class. It's great. Of course, uh, I'm going to feel like a fish in a fishbowl with a bunch of students looking at the observation window like, here, auger, 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 auger. All right, I will be back about 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes. Be back on the stream. I've got a lot of inoculations to do. I'm gonna be knocking up grain bags, sealing these plates, hanging out with you. Anyways, do me a favor, check out the website because if you support me, I can support you and uh, I can eat. I like eating, not to mention, I really actually just want to really put this new space through it, uh, the new space through its paces. Like, go ahead, challenge us. Like, <laughs> we can turn out so much stuff now. It's great. Anyways, I will be back online. Um, feel free to jump on, ask more questions. I'll be, yeah, the Triton substrate man, Psy Research. Dude, Triton, our Triton substrate. Okay, I have to go off about this. I'm about to do a YouTube tutorial on just Triton. We sterilize, let me blow everyone's mind, we sterilize all of our substrates. And the reason why is that science went back and learned that fungi farm their own bacteria. 
right? So fungi need bacteria to exist. Like, they need them to break down nutrients in the environment. So what scientists went and did, if you type into Google Scholar, mushroom cultivation, sterilization versus pasteurization, you'll find a whole bunch of papers. Every single one of them says, sterilizing your substrate leads to higher yields and higher bioefficiency every single time. And why is that? Why is that? It's because the less competition in the environment, the faster the fungus can bring its own bacteria to the yard, right? And it can grow faster than anything else. So if you're pasteurizing, try sterilizing, and I guarantee you, you're going to see significantly better results. Now, you do have to try to keep your environment kind of clean, but that's why you get a heap of air filter and do your mind. But yeah, we sterilize all of that substrate, and I have never seen something colonize that fast um, because we test everything, and we got testers that work in the community with us. We send out samples, and they come back and they're like, this is the fastest substrate we've ever seen. Like, I've seen people put um, therapeutic cultures to grain, put half a bag of that grain into a half a bag of Triton, and had that bag in a fruiting chamber within about three weeks. Like, it was ready to fruit within just two, three weeks. Probably sooner. So, it's crazy. I love this substrate. Anyways, I gotta go. I need to take a break because if I don't, I'm gonna wet my pants at the flow hood. No one wants to wet your pants at the flow hood. And I haven't found a lab catheter yet. All right, I go now.